So I've been making a lot of videos about Australia recently and why it would be so good to live there, all the good things about the country, and one of my viewers asked me if I could make a reaction to this video. It's called the top 10 reasons not to move to Australia. So after watching all of these videos, like for me there's like literally no reason not to want to move to Australia. It seems like the perfect place uh, and I'm very interested to find out what these could actually be, what any reason, never mind 10 uh, reason could be. So let's watch this and find out. Good eye mates, how you going? Cause today we're talking about the land down under, Australia. Is it a country? Is it a continent? Do kangaroos really just roam freely about? Sounds like fake news to me. But it's not. The world's sixth largest country is a giant three million square mile island continent stuck between the Indian and Pacific Oceans. And this strange geographic location is what makes Australia such an ecological and biological anomaly with so much diverse nature and wildlife unique only to the country. From Tasmania to the stunning beaches to the outback rainforests and Great Barrier Reef, there is so much natural yeah, beauty to be found. So but not only is the nature stunning, Australia is also home to a few highly advanced cosmopolitan cities, with the two biggest cities, Sydney and Melbourne, routinely ranking among the top five best cities to live in the world. Speaking of which, let's hit 5,000 likes and I'll do a video on the top 10 best cities to live in the world. Anyways, it isn't hard to see why the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have lived here for over 60,000 years. Of course, the British also did their imperialist thing and claimed the continent in 1788 as a penal colony for their convicts, but Australia eventually gained independence in 1901. And since then, the land down under has become a country with one of the highest qualities of life, a great healthcare and education system, incredibly low crime, vibrant and welcoming residents, and an excellent economy with hardly any poverty. Nonetheless, oh, only so good. And a half million so many people good points. actually live here, and less than 100,000 of those are US expats. Wait, there must be a reason only 1 to 4,000 new Americans immigrate here each year, right? Well, maybe you'll find out in my top 10 reasons not to move to Australia. <laughs> Number 10. It gets hot. Contrary to popular belief, most of Australia isn't all perfect year-round temperatures. Well, unless you're in Sydney or Perth, but even those get some bad days each year. And although a few cities on the southern coast in Tasmania actually get hit by really cold cold fronts coming up from Antarctica, the real issue in most of Australia is the heat. There is a reason nearly 90% of Australians live within 50 kilometers of the coast. The heat makes the rest of the country basically unlivable especially in the outback where temperatures can reach 50 degrees Celsius. That's 122 Fahrenheit. Heck, it gets so hot in the desert here that the opal miners back in the day ended up building an underground settlement called Cooper Pedy to protect them from the heat. It's mm. pretty cool, actually. And even that though the cool. cooling effects of the ocean make the coastal areas more livable, most of the cities will still get days above 40 degrees Celsius during the summer. Add in some of the most beautiful beaches in the world with tons of sunny days to enjoy, and the fact that you're pretty darn close to the equator, and it isn't hard to see why two-thirds of Australians are diagnosed with skin cancer by the age mm. of 70. Oh, and I'd be remiss to not talk about that other thing the heat and sun causes as well bushfires. Mm. You've probably already heard about the wildfires that have decimated 46 million acres and killed 451 people this past year alone, but sadly it's not the first, and it definitely won't be the last. <laughs> Number 9. Yeah, that, <clears throat> that is uh, something obviously I know uh, after watching some videos about the Australian geography and things, and yeah, people have told me about the, the bushfires have been like getting quite bad in certain areas uh, of Australia over the last couple of years or some places that have like uh, had terrible, terrible bad luck with the bushfires. Uh, for me personally, obviously living in Malaysia, it's 32 degrees every day of the year, between 31 and 35, pretty much 32. It's humid every day of the year, it doesn't change. Me coming from Scotland, which is like terrible weather coming here. It took not, not as long as I thought to acclimatize, but I just love this type of weather. I love warm weather. And tell me what you think about it. If you're from Australia, do you really 
embrace the warm weather? Do you love it? Do you ever get sick of it? Uh, those days when it goes above 50, what is that? Like, that? that is pushing it for me. I mean, not even 50, 40. Pushing it above 40 is a bit too much for me, but tell me what you think about that. It's isolated. You might have wondered why it's be the last. <laughs> Number nine. It's isolated. You might have wondered why so many Australians have left their beautiful homeland that seems a lot like paradise to most Americans. But the reality is that many Aussies feel trapped, lonely, and isolated from the rest of the world. Really? While you may think that's silly, since you can just hop on a plane and fly to a nearby country like Indonesia or Singapore, it actually isn't so simple. Most Australians live in the southeastern part of the country, so a flight mm. to it's anywhere far, other than New still, Zealand yeah. means crossing the giant continent of Australia and then some, or just the entire Pacific Ocean. Basically, even those close countries end up being anywhere from a 6 to 10 hour flight away. It's at least a 14 hour flight if you're going to the US. And you should expect to spend over 24 hours in airplanes and airports if you want to visit anywhere in Europe. And before you comment, So what if other countries are far away? Australia's huge! Just explore that! Well, the thing about that is that Australia isn't just isolated from other countries. The cities here are actually really isolated from each other. The land down under is the third least densely populated country in the world with just three people per square kilometer and it only has five real cities with metro populations over a million residents. So as I'm sure you can guess the population centers are very spread out and most of Australia is very remote. For example the two closest big cities would be Sydney and Melbourne but they're still an eight and a half hour drive apart. Melbourne to Brisbane's an 18 hour drive Adelaide to Darwin's a 31 hour drive, and Sydney to Perth is a 41 hour non stop trek with pretty much nothing in between. Now, yeah, tell me if you feel that as well. Like, do you feel isolated if you're from Australia? For me, I can't imagine Australians would, man. For me, like, the Australians I've interacted with on this channel just seem like they love Australia, love being in Australia, like, it's got everything you need there. And when he talks about flying like so so far to go to like Singapore and Indonesia, I don't think it's actually that much of a problem. I don't, I don't know if that's something that a lot, the majority of people would feel. I think most people would probably feel quite settled and happy. But tell me from your side. Number eight time zones. <coughs> Speaking of isolation, Australia isn't just physically isolated from other countries. You're also going to have trouble keeping in touch with your family or friends back home unless they live somewhere in Asia. Australia is an entire Pacific Ocean away from the US and two continents length away from Europe, so the time zones are practically exact opposites. Now Australia has three main time zones, but for the sake of just showing how different the times are, when it's 7am in Sydney, it's 10pm in London, and when it's 6 a.m. in Perth, it'd be 6 p.m. in New York. I get that this is just more of an inconvenience than a huge deal, but it can get pretty tedious yeah, trying to schedule a really call a with your international family and friends. Hey, Number it means you like have an excuse not to talk to your family and friends if you don't want to as well. trying to schedule a call with your international family and friends. Number seven the internet sucks. If you finally do manage to get a hold of your family and friends, time zones might not be the only thing that get in the way. Because even if you schedule that Zoom call perfectly, the internet might just randomly cut out or start lagging, and by the time it's fixed, it's probably the other person's bedtime. Sure, the United States isn't anywhere near the best when it comes to internet speeds compared to most developed countries, but it's light speed compared to Australia, which is only ranked as the 43rd best country for internet. And no, I don't just mean that on average it has relatively slow download and upload speeds. I mean the most expensive plans still disconnect or lag frequently, and a lot of the plans actually have data caps. Who does that anymore? A 200 gigabyte a month plan in Brisbane with download speeds only up to 12 megabits per second will cost you $65 a month. And don't even that think about going actually. over, or you'll have to pay an outrageous fee, and your internet speeds will slow down to 256 kilobytes per second. What developed nation has any internet speeds under one megabit per second? That's just ridiculous. Okay, that one does sound quite annoying, man. Is that true? Are the internet, <clears throat> internet speeds bad? Is the... The connection like unstable and things like that is it getting better have you seen improvements over time 
That one I can imagine because I, I, I get quite easily frustrated with the internet when it's going slow or where I, if I go somewhere that's got bad Wi-Fi or internet speeds, man, that does frustrate me a little bit. I don't remember there being any problems when I was in Melbourne, but tell me if you're from your own experience Number also. six, everything wants to kill you. If the frustratingly slow internet speeds are enough to make you want to go on a digital cleanse and take a camping trip out in the wilderness, well, don't, because literally everything here is trying to kill you. Yeah, Australia's home to box jellyfish, stonefish, tons of poisonous snakes and spiders, blue ringed octopuses, stingrays, sharks, and the largest saltwater crocodiles in the world. Wait, did you think I was done? No, no, I'm just getting started. Cause kangaroos, dingoes, cassowaries, emus, cone shells, and drop bears can all pose serious threats. Okay, well maybe not the drop bears since they don't actually exist, but the rest of those animals Is that have all taken Is that human lives. A Australia just isn't a place where you can spontaneously go for a hike or swim without being very cautious of your surroundings at all times. Heck, there's a story of a man being snatched out of his boat in a river by a giant crocodile while he was just going fishing with his family. Although don't get too worried because you're actually more likely to die by falling off a horse than from one of the deadly critters here. Just be careful and respect the animals whose homes you're visiting. Mm. Except for kangaroos. While well, you might think they're so cute and cuddly, they can be vicious and many Australians actually see them as pests. The only reason the country hasn't declared war on them yet is because the kangaroos outnumber Australians two to one and the Aussies don't want to repeat of what happened in the Great Emu War of 1932. Spoiler alert, the emus won. Now yeah, that one again, coming from an American where like crocodiles in Florida, bears all over the place. Like I have a friend in America who said there was like wolves like just prowling their, their neighborhood. I feel like it's very over-exaggerated the, the issues the animals pose to normal Australians in normal places. Number five bad drivers. While many Aussies try to blame the kangaroo and their lack of road sense as the reason for so many car accidents, only 7,992 kangaroo collisions actually occurred in 2019, which was less than 5% of the total automobile accidents in Australia. So maybe the drivers should start taking a little more responsibility. Now of course every town, city, state, and country is going to have its fair share of bad drivers, but the drivers in Australia are really some of the the worst in the world and I'm not just saying this is some American trying to diss Australia because I love Australia and even people from Australia will admit that the drivers here are terrible. In fact, Aussies actually upload more videos of illegal and bad road behavior than any other country. That is absolutely nonsense. That one I'm not accepting at all man. I, when I went to Melbourne, I rented a car. We were there for like two weeks. We rented a car and drove all over uh, around Melbourne and around the kind of outer area, outer, outer regions of Melbourne. And the driving was amazing. Coming from Malaysia, coming from Southeast Asia, where I've lived in Thailand, uh, China was okay. Ch Thailand and Malaysia. If you want to see terrible driving, come here, man. The driving is unbelievably bad. When I went to Australia and drove there, it felt like being in like a heavenly place, man. Like everybody's so friendly, giving way, driving properly, using signals, driving right to the speed limit. When, you, when I was on the highway, people all driving at the same speed in the speed limit. Here, everybody's going mental, driving all over the place. That one is not true. I'm just saying that, man. Number four. It's expensive. Aside from the aforementioned incredibly expensive internet, pretty much everything else here is expensive too. Because while Australia is big, it's still an isolated island, so a lot of things have to be shipped over long distances to get here. Of course, the cost of living varies based on location, with it generally being cheaper the farther you get from the coast and major cities, but Australia as a whole is pretty pricey. Granted, it is balanced out by the decent job pay since Australia 
Australia actually has the highest after-tax minimum wage of any country mm -hmm. and a top 10 average income at around 64,000 One of the US best quality of living is like you pay for what again, you get. This also just creates an expensive cycle since the high minimum wage means high production costs, which means it's cheaper to import goods, but imported goods are expensive and well, that's just economics. And even though most of the wages are livable, they're not necessarily enough to buy a home, especially in Sydney or Melbourne where the median home values are 1.15 million and 855,000 Australian dollars respectively. That's that is nearly 820,000 US dollars for your average home in Sydney. Number three places close early. To add on to the fact that things are expensive here, it might be difficult to even buy said things if you're working normal hours, since most shops, stores, and restaurants usually close by the time the sun sets during the week. And if they operate at all on the weekends, they're probably going to have even more limited hours. This one isn't a huge deal once you're used to it and plan accordingly, but it can be a big culture shock if you're coming from the states where there's an abundance of 24-hour businesses businesses. Now to be fair, a few places do actually stay open later if you're in a big city like Sydney, Brisbane, or Melbourne, but it's hard to buy things past 5 or 6 p.m. pretty much anywhere else. Yeah, I think that's just fair for the workers to give them their work-life balance and I think again like you said, once you get used to it, for me like Malaysia is very like open all hours type thing. The malls are open till 10 p.m. There's a lot of eateries that are 24 hours that they're open and stuff like that so but for me actually like it's nice to actually just have not anything to think about to have to do that at night time you can just relax don't need to go here or there can just chill man and let the workers have their time to Number do that two, as well poor mental health services despite their vivacious exterior australians usually keep their feelings to themselves it's just not normal to talk about personal problems here and the mental health of the nation is suffering for it now there are free care options available for at-risk individuals but since there's a shortage of psychologists it's left many other people with no one to talk to about their problems unless they pay a lot of money out of pocket and even then, many doctors and citizens as a whole aren't well educated in the case of mental health here, so good therapy isn't easy to find. One in five Australians between the ages of 16 and 85 have experienced mental health illness, and over 20% of young Australians struggle with depression or anxiety. Maybe the mental health issues here actually contribute to that risk-taking, fearless reputation most Australians have earned themselves, since it's kind of the culture here to just suck up your problems and pretend you're always having a good time. Now, before we get to number one, make sure- Tell me if that's true, and tell me if that changes over time as well, I know that like in a lot of countries, it's, it's just becoming more and more acceptable to like have these problems and talk about them and stuff. But there's a lot of campaigns and things. Some countries lag behind others. Like here in Asia, it's not very common to talk about things like that. But in Western countries, it is. So maybe it's just different countries' progress on that at different you leave a like Speeds. and subscribe and if you'd want to see more videos about australia or any other countries in general let me know in the comments but without further ado number one the immigration process is very difficult. While visiting Australia is as easy as having a valid passport, filling in an online application, and paying a small fee, becoming a permanent resident is incredibly difficult for US citizens. Now for young Americans eager to explore the world, Australia does offer a program known as the Working Holiday Visa, which allows you to live in the country for a year or two in exchange for paid work. But if you want to move here permanently, there are a lot of requirements, such as a confirmation of funds, a skill set assessment, proficiency in English, a health exam, no criminal record, and being under the age of 45. For the most part, you either have to have a lot of money saved up and plan to start a business in Australia, or offer a highly desired skill that no available Australian worker has. So while it's definitely easier to move here than to certain countries in Europe, it's still very difficult for your average American to immigrate here permanently, and that's probably why only one to four thousand Americans do it each year. Yeah, I think that's. I'm sure more would if they could. But I, I think that's fair enough. Like I've spoken briefly about the immigration uh, situation in Australia, and I, I really like the way 
Australia sure manages their immigration and it works like they actually bring people who are educated and they settle in the country very well and assimilate with Australians and become proud to be Australians. That is something like definitely other countries cannot say that they do well, like UK, US, I, I feel don't do it as well as Australia do. So for me, like it's fine that they're strict and they're, they, they, they want high quality people to come to the country. And tell me what you think about all of them. I think it, none of them would put me off moving to Australia for sure. Still seems like the perfect place to live. Tell me what you think about them. Thanks.